Good evening. Welcome to Inside Out. I'm Pat Smith, and this is where we take you inside state, local, and federal government to bring the information out to you. Helping me do that tonight is Democratic nominee for county executive here in Montgomery County, Mark Elridge. Welcome. Welcome. How you doing? Good to have you. Thank you. It has uh, really been an interesting race. You had a very tough primary fight, mm -hmm. uh, but you eked out a win there against a lot of money. Yes. And uh, so you got to be feeling pretty good about it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's good to see the public financing worked. Um, public financing gave me enough money to be competitive. I mean, you know, normally because I didn't take money from developers ever, I'd be limited to about 120,000, 125. Public financing let me at least be competitive. I'd never, you know, I was never going to get five and a half million dollars, but mm -hmm. I could get enough to get a message out. Okay. So now, after the primary, there's you and the Republican nominee, and now you have the independent, Nancy Florine, who's been a colleague of yours on the county <coughs> council for years. Pretty how, much. <laughs> how long have you been on the council? I've been on 12 years. Okay. So you would have been term limited this year, right? Right. But I'd already, yeah, I'd already decided I was going to run for executive because I, right. could, I could make right. it clear he was not going to run for a fourth term. And I had made it clear that I was going to run. I was going to run last time, but I decided to go for a third term. Mm -hmm. And um, Ms. Florine's in the same similar situation. She was due to be leaving the right. council because of term limits. And then after the primary ballot, ballot battles, right. that's when she came into the race. Yeah. Okay. Could you uh, help us with your experience and background? I know that you've served on the uh, uh, Tacoma Park uh, Council, and then you served as an at-large member here on right. Montgomery County Council. So you're familiar <laughs> with the entire county, but particularly much. Uh, down southeast corner of the, uh, of the county, which is uh, really a vibrant part of the county, again, and uh, much to do I like with the, things, uh, the development of Silver Spring. Right. Uh, and I know there was a little tit for tat between you and one of the other candidates about whether you were involved in the Silver Spring redevelopment or not. Yeah, I mean, th that was really actually insulting on her part. Um, first place, Duncan appointed me to the revitalization committee. Mm -hmm. And when the American dream fell through, and I was part of the citizens group that said this is never going to work, the malls are a dying breed. Mm -hmm and that we shouldn't be doing this. And I was in a minority on that committee, but even Duncan pulled the plug. Every time he would say yes to the Grimazians, they'd come back and say, well, we want more money. And at one point, it just got to the point that it was obvious mm -hmm. this is never gonna work without a ton of money. So I wound up on the second committee and Folger Pratt came forward with this project that was street-facing retail. And it looked a lot like a project that the citizens had developed with Dorn McGrath, who was an architect mm -hmm. at Catholic University. And I supported it. It preserved AFI. It brought in, you know, quality program. It was the Silver Theater. So it preserved the right. Silver Theater, brought in the AFI. I thought it was a good thing. And it was street-facing retail, which is what we were trying to create there, a livable, walkable, mm -hmm. you know, hub in, in mm -hmm. downtown Silver Spring. And so I was part of the group that not only voted for it, but had advocated for it before it became fashionable to actually agree we were going to do this. And then to say that I was opposed to development in Silver Spring was just untrue. Okay. So prior to your involvement in politics, education was your, 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 your wheelhouse. Well, I, I did both. You know, I was a teacher for 17 years, but I was also serving on the Tacoma Park Council because that's a part-time job. And I had run for county council also because, you know, when you're a teacher, um, I got into it because I wanted to make a difference. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, you don't do this for the money. And I taught in my neighborhood school, which is what you would call a highly impacted school, um, very high farms rate, very, very high ESOL rate. Um, but it was, the, it was the school that was in my neighborhood, and I, and I wanted to help, and I wanted to be a, a part of the community. Um, but the more you're in that, you realize that ultimately the ability of a school or anything to develop or to provide services and programs that were really changeful, change for people, bring mm -hmm. change for people, um, it was really the county that controlled the strings, the purse strings. And so school overcrowding 
is you know, directly a result of how much money I invest in either teachers or in classrooms. And um, the social circumstances that people live in mm -hmm. are determined in some part by county policy. So I got more and more interested in the interplay of you know, so, social circumstances mm -hmm. and the impact on children and their learning. So then the work in the council dovetails yeah. uh, naturally uh, with what your goals right. were in education as well. Yeah, I mean, one of the first things I, I did on the council was I was on the uh, Planning, Housing, and Economic Development Committee, and we changed some of the rules in the growth policy. And the old, when I got on the council, I think it was that a whole cluster had to be overcrowded at 145% for the entire cluster for you to put a cluster in moratorium. And that was crazy because we had schools at 180%, 185%, and schools at 100 and it averaged out to just under 145. So you could continue mm -hmm. putting kids into that cluster, even if it was right next to a school that was right. at 180% of capacity. So I was able to bring that down to, I think it was 125. I tried 120, I didn't get there the first time. Um, but at least bring it down to a lower number. And the irony was, because the school system at that time was still too tied to Montgomery County politics, frankly. Um, the school system opposed the initial efforts to bring down the definition of what an overcrowded school was. Really? Which just was surreal. Because on the one hand, they all know, they, every superintendent knew the impact on learning that comes from class sizes that are sure. too big. Yeah. So it was more of a problem than it should have been. Understood. It, uh, and it continues to be a big problem, and we just keep building apartments, building apartments, building apartments, and they're all for rent. Yes. Where are people going to come to rent or get back into home ownership when you have to put 20% down? And the average home in Montgomery County is four hundred fifty thousand dollars. Where are you going to get ninety thousand dollars to put down? Um, I mean, obviously, home ownership has become a problem. Uh, what we're doing with rental is a problem because, you know, I've asked this question, particularly on the west side of the county where we've mm -hmm. just done all these master plans. And I asked planning, uh, could you tell me what kind of apartments are being built? Well, they said, well, 80% of the apartments are one bedroom apartments. Mm -hmm. And the other 20% are a combination of studios and two bedroom apartments and virtually no threes. Not, I can't say no threes, but very few threes. Very few certainly three no bedroom, four. Yeah. So we're building no family housing on the west side of the county. And it's primarily one bedrooms. The one bedrooms are expensive. So it's not affordable to most people. So we get some MPDUs, but not a lot. Mm -hmm. And certainly not, we don't get enough MPDUs to offset um, the loss of affordable housing that just comes from rising rents in the county. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my favorite people, uh, Rob Goldman from Montgomery Housing Partnership likes to point out that we lost 35,000 housing units or more to affordability since 2000. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of housing units. I, mm -hmm. I can assure you, we produce nothing like that in the way of MPDUs. We're lucky if we get 400 a year on average. Yeah. So over you know, 15 years, maybe, maybe you got 6,000, 6, but you lost 35,000. So that's a battle we're losing. So I've, been a, I've tried to focus on making sure the council doesn't rezone existing affordable housing out of existence. Mm -hmm. And I've lost some of those fights. In Bethesda, the planning board, uh, Gwen Wright, I asked her whether we were gonna have more housing, more affordable units when this plan is built out than today, and the answer was no. I don't understand how you do a plan for 20 years from now, have less affordable housing than you have today when you know that demand is only gonna grow. Right. And you're not satisfying the demand that exists today. And so in my mind, you know, we're just exacerbating the east-west divide. We talk all we want about how we need to integrate the west side of the county. Mm -hmm. and, you know, kids should be able to go to school on the west side of the county. I guarantee you if all they build is one-bedroom apartments, um, I'm not getting families on the west side. And we should be more integrated than we are. Agreed. 20-year mm, plan without the consideration for... Not enough what the generations that are in elementary school now are going to be doing. Well, this, you know, these schools right now are overcrowded over there. And it's a funny thing that in places where, like Bethesda, it's under the most pressure, the school system is wrong virtually year after year in their projections for a school. And, but their total number has been a lot closer. 
-hmm. And you wonder how their total number can be close, but their number in a place like Bethesda is consistently underestimates the number of kids who are going to go to the schools there. I mean, I, the impact of that is you get to approve projects by saying, well, there aren't, those, aren't going to be those many kids here. You can go ahead and build this project. Uh -huh. But then, you, then the next year you discover that you had you, you know, know, 40, schools. 50 more kids than you had than you thought you were going to have every year. You can't only do make that mistake so many times before that trend becomes worrisome. Yeah. As county executive, we have been fortunate with the 12 <coughs> years with Dyke Leggett and before that 12 years with Doug Duncan. They were very, very well known and well thought of in Annapolis. They, used, they called them both the, uh, the, the <laughs> senator from uh, Montgomery the, County. Yeah, from Montgomery County. Uh, are you very familiar with a lot of the legislators from across the state to get down there and yeah. work, especially on getting brick, uh, brick and mortar for money back for schools? Yes, I mean, I, um, when Roger Mano was there, Roger used to have uh -huh. this uh, spaghetti night. And I used to go down to the spaghetti night with him because he would invite legislators from just not just Montgomery County, but from other districts there. And I found it a really nice way to interface with people mm -hmm. um, and talk to them about what you needed without walking into their office and saying, this is a lobbying mission, right. and this is what I want. It was like the ability to sit down over you know, spaghetti and wine and some bread and talk about what do we all need. Right. Um, I want to you know, kind of reinvigorate that. I want to be able to, I plan on being down there regularly in session. I've talked to our legislative leaders and I said, look, you know, you need to let me know what you need me to do. I don't want to come down here as a bull in the china shop. Um, I need to understand from your perspective mm -hmm. what's the most effective things I can do to help you advance your agendas as well as advance the county's agenda. And, and I understand because I think some people don't understand that, you know, when you're elected to a county council or county executive, you're singularly focused on the county. But there are people who go to Annapolis who are from the county and think about the county, but you might be, you know, really committed to health care. Or mm -hmm. you might be really committed to doing something about how the state um, treats people with mental health issues. Mm -hmm. or. Um, people who are concerned about crime and the school to prison pipeline. So people go to Annapolis sometimes for more complex reasons. Mm -hmm. And so I think we need to understand how we support their agendas down there as well as making clear what the needs of Montgomery County are so we can all work together mm -hmm. and get on the same page. Um, and I'm gonna work very hard to do that. Does the Democratic Central Committee still do that breakfast on a Sunday before the legislative session I, so that all the councils are there? Everybody gets on the same page. And we, we've had a breakfast, but you don't. You know, you you only get on the same page if you're there regularly, because the page turns every week. There you go. And and you don't yeah. know who's put a bill in and what's you know what's coming next and what's the state of play. It works really fast. Time for us to take okay. a quick break. Thank you. Uh, I'm Pat Smith. You're watching Inside Out. I'm with Democratic candidate for County Executive Mark Elridge. We'll be right back. Welcome back. I'm Pat Smith. You're watching Inside Out. This is where we take you inside state, local, and federal government to bring information out to you. Helping me do that tonight is our Democratic candidate for county executive, Mark Elridge. Mark, we got to mention, voting is coming up. Yes. November the 6th is the date, right? It is the day. The poll vote, but uh, early voting starts next week? Yep. Okay, so folks have to keep that in mind and they have to get out and vote. Uh, we want a right. blue wave. We'll have it we in do. Montgomery County, but we want a blue wave throughout the, the uh, state. We have a chance. Uh, the Republicans feel like they have a chance out there in the uh, Western Congressional District, but hopefully the nominee, David Trone, will hold on to that for the Democrats. I hope so. It was a surprise to me that, just in mentioning Western Maryland, that uh, we lost key legislators in these congressional races of late. We lost Rob Garagiola, we lost Roger Mano this year. Mm -hmm. uh, and th those are big shoes to fill. As you remember, as you mentioned earlier, Roger Mano was doing right. the spaghetti dinners and stuff like that. We need more of that kind of camaraderie to keep the communication lines open. Look, you've got a lot of young people coming into legislature, a lot of new people. 
uh, I think they're eager to, to learn and they're eager to be productive. Uh, if you go down there and you're not focused on being productive, you can be very frustrated. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not a glorious job. Right. And you don't find your name in the newspaper very often because there is no newspaper left in Montgomery County. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Post really doesn't no, cover no, the no, state no. legislature. So, you know, you, you really have to, I think, work very hard down there and be focused on and how you're going to build coalitions and get things through. And I think delegates, um, I've, I've met a bunch of these folks, they're really passionate about the things they want to do. And I think they understand uh, the complexity of the world they're going into. You know, if you want coverage of Annapolis, it's got to be the Baltimore Sun. Yeah. Uh, daily Record. Which is in the Daily Record, both of which I get electronically, which is, is, is very handy now. But uh, and it, there used to be a store in my neighborhood that sold the hard copy of the Baltimore Sun. So for years, I've been getting it. But not only for Annapolis news, news in their metro section, but also it has an actual sports section. <laughs> For someone from Boston, yes. that's very, very important. Yes. <laughs> I, I don't get baseball boxes where you get like a paragraph or less, less about the game. When I was a kid growing up, I used to love reading the extended description of what right. happened in a ball game. Mm -hmm. uh, and to reduce it to a paragraph is just tragic loss Something of journalism. It is. It is. <laughs> um, so what do you, how do you differentiate yourself from the other candidates? So... And I'm not going to talk about Robin. Robin. Robin's on a very different place than most of us. But, you know, over the years, my focus has been on making sure if you have economic growth, or you're going to have development, that development comes with infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And we didn't get to be the worst transportation place in the world and have these very overcrowded schools and a $1.5 billion deficit in what our school needs are for construction, both providing classrooms and doing proper maintenance. We didn't get that way by accident. Mm -hmm. And if we continue to allow development without also saying, guys, you got to put some money into um, programs, into the kitty to provide the classroom space and, and transportation, meet transportation needs, we're going to continue to struggle. And I won't say they don't put any money in, but mm -hmm. they don't put enough in. And the way we structure particularly impact taxes uh, is not a very good program. I, I could get wonky for a moment, but it's just imagine if somebody gave you a bag of money, that's your impact tax, and it was meant to solve problems in a particular area, but the money's not enough to do it. So instead of that money staying in that area, it goes into the county, into the impact tax fund, and then the first project that comes along that could use that money may not be a project where the person gave the money. Right. So my view is to change taxing system much like to what much like Virginia has, which is you would do a commercial taxing district, special taxing district, and every all the commercial properties kick in, but they only kick in when you have a project. So if there was a project that was designed for Bethesda, you would figure out the price of the project, you'd start phase one, which would be design engineering, there'd be a small tax, you'd get into construction. But the tax would be spread out over 20 years. And mm -hmm. it's probably no more money, essentially, than what you otherwise would have paid, except you, take, you, come, you come at it over a longer period of time. And your money actually goes to build the projects that you need to support mm -hmm. the development. Um, I don't view this as particularly hostile to business. Uh, this is what they do in Northern Virginia to great excess, success. So when people talk about how does Virginia get to do these things, well, they have a different taxing structure. They make sure that the money comes in is targeted toward the infrastructure you need. I think we can do that here, and I think we need to do that here. I think that you know developers will say we need certainty. I agree. I think, again, Virginia has a more certain process that when you've gone through a planning process, mm -hmm. you pretty much know what you're going to do. But the flip side of Virginia is the residents know that if you've gone through a planning process, if a developer is obligated to do X, Y, and Z, you are going to get X, Y, and Z. You know, pretty pictures shown during uh, a meeting in front of the planning board, mm -hmm. they need to be the same pretty pictures that get built. If there are parks, the parks need to actually be what's in the plan. If there's transportation improvements, they actually need to be in the final plans that get approved, and it all has to work in the master plan so that we put all this together. We have not done a good job of putting it all together. I think, you know, some of my colleagues 
talk about nimbyism, and they like to throw that word around. Uh, what it really discounts is people are concerned about things like school overcrowding. Mm -hmm. They're concerned about massive congestion with no relief in sight. Bethesda is a case in point when I asked the planning staff, when would, the tra when would transportation be in balance in Bethesda? They said 15 to 20 years from now. It's not like 15 or 20 months, which people could right. probably deal with. Right. 15 or 20 years, you can have a baby, and the baby could be grown up and, and into college before anything happens. Right. So we could have done a better job. I think we should do a better job. So that's you know, probably the biggest area of difference. Um, Nancy would like to say that you know, this fascination with zoning things for higher density is about jobs, but the truth is it's not about jobs. It's just about zoning a building. Um, developers buildings don't usually come with jobs, which is why you don't see a lot of, you know, for all the zoning we've done, all the upzoning we've done, people like Nancy still complain about the lack of economic development in the county. Well, if zoning was the key to economic development and job growth, we should be awash in new commercial businesses and jobs, and we're not. Mm -hmm. So my preference is to focus on what would it take to improve occupancy of existing spaces, I have 10 million square feet of uh, vacant office space, commercial space, half of it's class A, half of it's class B. Mm -hmm. And it's been that way since I got elected in 2006. So we've got this problem we haven't been able to solve. Having that vacant space isn't deterrent to anybody else building new buildings. So I would prefer us to focus more on how do you create businesses. I think you know Montgomery County has seen a loss of small businesses, which is a national phenomenon, not just a county mm -hmm. phenomenon. There was a big article in the New York Times sure. about what's happening in New York right now. Right. Um, rents are rising, and it's making it harder and harder for mom and pops mm -hmm. to survive. Uh, my focus is on how do you uh, reinvigorate the local economy? How do you help people stay in business? How do you make it easier if you're going to expand to expand? Uh, we hear, and I, I've heard so much of this, this constant repetition of the theme is we're the worst place in the world to do business. And this, I heard, heard it before, yeah. but as I'm out there campaigning, I hear this in spades. Anytime in front of a group of people where there are small business people, this is recurrent. And we have never really addressed it. Now, you know, Nancy says it's because we're mean and, uh, you know, businesses don't feel appreciated. If they could make money here, they didn't run into ridiculous obstacles. I'm sure they would deal with feeling we're, you know, not as gentle as we should be, and they, because they would make money. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there are real impediments to people um, opening businesses in this county. And so what I want to do, and I've talked to Sid Katz, he's a council member, mm -hmm. um, to head up a committee with a short life to just benchmark Montgomery County's rules and regulations against all the surrounding jurisdictions. And if we're requiring things and doing things that nobody else is doing, then we're not going to keep doing it. And if our fees are out of line with everybody else's fees, we're going to bring them in line. And I think for people who are actually trying to open a business, a lot of them find if they're taking a space that was vacant but was previously used, that they're being asked to bring the buildings up to the latest codes. Other jurisdictions, it seems to be, are grandfathering more things. They're letting people not necessarily, oh, yeah. and there's a reason for it. I mean, if, if I told you, you know, the last code said a toilet stall had to be this wide, the new code says six inches wider, um, the rational person might look at it and say, well, does it really matter right now? Mm -hmm. and, and so the, the horror story I heard out of that is somebody who had to move a wall, but when they moved the wall, it came up against the standing urinal that was in the men's room. Now the standing urinal had to be moved. So what was a simple six screws slided over, six screws back in, became, yeah, you're doing that, and now you're ripping the tile off the wall, cutting the pipes, moving mm -hmm. the urinal. And we need to think about that. Did that mm -hmm. need to be done or should have been done when there was a major renovation of the facility? And that's, you know, that's one example, and, and people keep giving me many examples. So my view is I don't think we're any safer or healthier than any other jurisdiction. You know, read about terrible things happening in buildings in Frederick mm -hmm. or Howard County. So we ought to adopt, I think, a more flexible approach to what we allow people or require people to do on reoccupancy. Mm -hmm. And I think that'll help small businesses not spend as much money on uh, fitting and finishing their property out. Uh, it'll encourage them to actually stay here as opposed to go to a jurisdiction that may be more lenient than we are. But as you say now, with all of that, 
square footage of commercial space that's available. What did you say? It was 10 million 10 square million. feet? Um, that's a lot. It's an awful lot. And you still think, see things like in Rockville Town Center. Silver Springs doing very well with the streets, the street access retail, doing very well. Right. Rockville, it's a continuing ro roving, re revolving door right. on all of these, and they keep closing. They just lost four big tenants. Yeah, and I think the reason in Rockville is paying for the parking. If you go out to Town Crown, if you go out to Kentlands, if you go out to Germantown Town Center, it, it's it, free parking, yeah. and people uh, appreciate that. So you would think, since this is a private development, you would think the owners of the private development would understand the linkage between their parking fees and the success of their merchants. Right. And, and the parking fees are an issue. Mm -hmm. And I know the city of Rockville has heard this before. Uh, and, but they've also been hit by extraordinary rent increases. Yeah. I mean, re and so if you're in an area that you know already is struggling, why are you raising the rent? You know, because it's not like their costs went up. They wasn't sold to a new owner who right. suddenly has a different capital base on the project. They have the same base on the project that they had five years ago. And so some of these rent increases, at least from the owner's perspectives, seem extraordinary. Okay. And they can't stay. Yeah. We only have a, a yeah. minute or so left. I want to touch on uh, public safety, if we could. Uh, quickly, because we sure. have this big problem with this MS-13 and uh, the way they're recruiting younger people to come into their gangs. And I know over on the east side of the county, as well as up in Gaithersburg and other places, but particularly on the east side of the county, uh, they're pretty well rooted. Do you have a plan to uh, attack that? I know that we've got a great chief. Uh, he's been here on the show several times, and he's determined to make things work. But... It, the crime continues. So, um, it, it's interesting we look at the data because last year wasn't a terribly good year, right. but this year murders are down. Yeah. Um, we appropriated money last year to give them uh, more resources in the prosecutor's office and more resources in the police department. And it I'm not, not going to take credit and say I think this brilliant move reduce the crime, because it's too early to say that. Right. But what they told us was that they were heavily dependent on the federal government, particularly with the gang things, for investigations into gang operations. And gang, this is not like small gangs just hanging out, a bunch of guys on the corner. This is an organized crime. It really is organized International. crime. International organized crime. And so our folks have been very constrained by the amount of cooperation they get from the feds. So McCarthy asked for, John McCarthy, state's attorney, asked for more resources for investigations so they could do more of this independently, and we gave it to them. And the police department asked for more resources that would be focused on, on gang issues, and we gave it to them. And on the social end, we put in more money into programs that are meant to uh, strengthen, strengthen some of these families. We have a lot of these older kids um, you know, they call them children fleeing violence, mm -hmm. who came here, they're staying with relatives, but they're not necessarily mothers and fathers. And that's, that's a hard relationship. And you've right. been someplace else, had your life play out there, and suddenly you're living with somebody else. A lot of difficult issues. So we've, tr we've suggested that we put more money into strengthening support services for the families and the kids, so the kids just don't get angry and leave, and the parents don't give up and say, get out. Or that the gang life looks yes. like more attractive. Exactly. And that's the other thing. You should make working more attractive than gang life. And that's something right. we need to work on. Right. Well, we wish you the best of luck, Thank Mark you. Elrich. He's a 12-year member of our county council, an educator by choice uh, back for 17 years, and now a uh, Democratic nominee for county executive here in Montgomery County. Vote November 6th. I'm Pat Smith. You're watching Inside Out.